Good afternoon, colleagues from the media. I'm very glad to meet you again virtually at the press briefing from the Presidential Palace in Jakarta. Colleagues, COVID-19 virus does not only affect the health of the people, but it also brings socio-economic impact, especially for the vulnerable groups. Every country, including Indonesia, work very hard to assist its people to cope with this difficult situation. Since the very beginning of the pandemic, President Jokowi has set a high priority on social safety net for the people. The well-being of the people is always in the heart of the President. Today, I'm honored to have with us Minister Giuliari Batubara, Minister of Social Affairs. I'm sure that Minister Batubara will share with you on the government's effort to distribute assistance to people in need, as well as how he addresses the challenges we encounter. Professor Viku Adisasmito is with us also today. Colleagues, first I will update you on the development related to Indonesia cooperation with other partners, especially on the provisions of medical equipment. On the 5th June 2020, Indonesia has received the first and second batch of medical supplies from China. This includes more than 150,000 PCR test kits, 80,000 medical masks, 1.3 million surgical masks, 80,000 PPEs, as well as 50 portable ventilators. With the United States, we continue to communicate and receive information that the first batch shipment of ventilators is scheduled to arrive early July 2020 with a total 100 ventilators. With Japan, we have received additional support and this time channeled through three international organizations, namely Asia Productivity Organization or APO, and then the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and Empowerment of Women, UN Women, and then United Nations on Development Program or UNDP. Colleagues, for my second point, in the last seven days, Indonesia's international engagement related to COVID-19 as well as peace and security issues, including my engagement with fellow foreign ministers and colleagues remains high on the agenda. Last Friday, the 5th of June, I participated in the Women Foreign Ministers Meeting on COVID-19 with a team, Gender Impact of COVID-19, Women's Role in Economic Recovery. And this was the second meeting of the group after the first meeting in April. In this meeting, I raised the importance of protecting and empowering women migrant workers, women entrepreneurs, especially MSMEs, and women peacekeepers in time of COVID-19. In the new normal, business as usual cannot be sustained. That is why I underline the need to push the reset button to create women-friendly policies amidst COVID-19 pandemic. To this end, it is essential to continue our effort to further empower, support, and enhance women's role in addressing COVID-19, as well as promoting economic recovery while guaranteeing their safety, access, and well-being during this pandemic. On Monday, 8 June 2020, I had a phone conversation with the Special Envoy of U.S. Government for Afghanistan. We touched based on development of the peace process in Afghanistan. I appreciated the U.S. role to sustain peace process in Afghanistan. 
I also encourage a permanent ceasefire and reduction of violence as both will continue to create conducive situation for intra-Afghan negotiation. During the conversation, I reiterated Indonesia's high commitment to contribute to intra-Afghan negotiation. Moreover, I discussed the Afghan issue again during my phone call with the Acting Foreign Minister of Afghanistan on Wednesday, 10 June 2020. I conveyed the same messages to the Minister. On Tuesday, 9 June 2020, in my engagement with the President of the ICRC, the International Red Cross, I appreciated the close cooperation between ICRC and Indonesia. We discussed concern on the increasing cyber attack on hospital and health facilities, the rise of misinfo damage in the times of COVID-19, as well as development on Rachenstedt and Cox Bazaar. On the same day, Tuesday, 9 June, I participated on the ministerial virtual conference of COVID-19 International Coordination Group or ICG meeting. And this meeting is the ninth meeting of the group has had so far. I flagged only one issue during the meeting, that is the collaboration in vaccine development to fight COVID-19. I underline the need to ensure that when vaccine of COVID-19 is finally found, countries will not risk to fulfill its domestic needs at the expense of others. To anticipate this, I underlined during the meeting the importance of three things. First, to create a fair, transparent and inclusive mechanism on allocation of supplies particularly to the most vulnerable. Second, to ensure transfer of knowledge from vaccine producers to countries to allow scaling up of production. And to achieve this, other than flexibility of intellectual property rules or trips, patent rights policy must also consider social responsibility especially during the pandemic. So once again, social responsibility is very important to be considered. Third, to encourage more international cooperation on vaccine development and production, and to create a synergy between national and international efforts. During the ICG meeting, I also explained that Indonesia had established a national consortium that involves relevant ministries and the Ekman Institute. The Ekman Institute is currently doing genome sequences and vaccine seed preparation. This is part of the process to develop self-reliance on vaccine. At the same time, Indonesia is also open to explore potential collaboration on vaccine procurement and joint production of different types of vaccine with all international stakeholders, including with the ICG countries. During the meeting, I also underlined how important this group is, especially since the group is able to build trust amidst a time of crisis and the group is able to pave the way for action-oriented activities as well as to be the moral force, I repeat, the moral force in post-COVID agenda, including empowering multilateralism and inclusiveness. On Wednesday, 10 June, I participated on the extraordinary open-ended ministerial meeting of the OIC in the face of the Israelis' plan to conduct annexation of the West Bank. For Indonesia, the OIC extraordinary meeting is very important. 
The word extraordinary reflects the gravity of the situation. Indonesia welcomed the result of the meeting that shows the solid and unified position of the OIC to reject the annexation plan. Indonesia hopes that the implementation of the OIC resolution on the threat of the Israeli occupation government to annex part of the state of Palestine territory occupied in 1967 will give extraordinary impact to the people of Palestine. The resolution, among others, highlighted the commitment to take up Israeli annexation plan to all relevant UN forums such as UNSC, UNGA, UNHRC, as well as international court and international organization. A call for international community to take all necessary legal countermeasures against Israeli annexation plan and a request for international quartet to convene an emergency meeting to encourage peace and work toward realization of a two-state solution. During the, uh, during the extraordinary OIC meeting, I made an appeal to OIC member state for a massive OIC mobilization, both within and beyond the OIC. In this regard, I highlighted three steps on how OIC can move forward to prevent the annexation from happening. First, the importance of unity of the OIC to firmly reject the annexation during this critical junction. Second, OIC countries must become the engine of collective action in various global forums to denounce this annexation. And third, the need to resume credible multilateral negotiation guided by internationally agreed parameters with the aim to achieve the two-state solution. And yesterday was a busy day. I also had virtual discussion with seven new ambassadors from Guatemala, Brazil, Cuba, Egypt, Mauritania, Qatar, and UAA following their presentation of letters of credential to the President of Indonesia. Colleagues, my next update is regarding the return of Indonesian crew of the Tian Yu-8 fishing vessel and the case of mistreated Indonesian crews on Long Sin 629. On June 9, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia facilitated the return of two Indonesian crews to Jakarta. Both crews have undergone valid PCR tests and have obtained health clearance from the Indonesian authorities at Soekarno-Hatta Airport. This means that all 46 crews of Dalian Ocean Fishing companies have been repatriated back to Indonesia. Meanwhile, on the legal proceeding, I would like to share that the Indonesian National Criminal Agency or Bareskrim has continued investi investigation effort including with the Attorney General to settle legal issues related to Indonesian crews on Long Sin 629. Indonesia looks forward to receiving results of a fair and transparent investigation on the case of the case from the Chinese authorities. My last point, is, uh, my last point, colleagues, is regarding the status of the Indonesian returnees plus per 10 June 2020. In total, as of yesterday, more than 100. 10,000 Indonesian, to, to be more exact, 110,457 have returned home, an increase of 2,807 
within a week. Between 18 March to 10 of June, 81,425 Indonesians have returned from Malaysia, an increase of 1,221 compared to last week. This includes 44, 449, I repeat, 449 Indonesians who have returned to Indonesia via Kuala Namu, Sukarno Hatta, and Juanda Airport last yesterday. Sorry, last uh, airport last Saturday. I repeat, this includes 449 Indonesians who have returned to Indonesia via Kuala Namu, Sukarno Hatta, and Juanda Airport last Saturday. All of them have undergone PCR tests. Meanwhile, 21,733 Indonesian crew have returned from 29 countries and arriving in Indonesia through dedicated entry points in Jakarta and Bali. And this is an increase of 1,096 compared to last week. 7,299 Indonesians have returned home via self-repatriation from 43 countries. This is an increase of 490 compared to last week. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia also continues to extend assistance to Indonesian abroad who are in need. Between 18 March to 10 June 2020, in Malaysia alone, our embassies and consulate and, and consulate general have distributed 298,007 packages of basic needs. And with the help of the Indonesian diaspora, we managed to provide 407,000 175 packages in total in Malaysia. This brings our total assistance globally to 474,947 packages, including in the Middle East, Asia Pacific, Europe, America, and Africa. Colleagues, this is all from me. And now, allow me to invite the Minister of Social Affairs, Minister Batubara, to convey some updates on mitigating social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Minister Batubara, the floor is yours, and thank you very much, colleague. Thank you very much, Madam Minister Ratno. A very good day to all of you. First of all, um, as the head of the Social Affairs Ministry, uh, Minister of Social Affairs, I'm responsible of performing uh, several tasks in response to COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. During normal conditions, we have two anchor programs. There are family hope program and the non-cash food assistance program. I'm going to be very brief. Um, I have some slides to to show you. Um, the first slide will tell you about the lineup of the social assistance programs that we are currently running or we are currently in place. The two programs in the bracket, these are the two anchor programs that during normal conditions uh, we run in the Ministry of Social Affairs. Number one is the Family Hope Program or Program Keluarga Harapan in Bahasa Indonesia which is a conditional cash transfer to 10 million households throughout the country. And second is the program Sembako, or non-cash food assistance program for 20 million households. 
the next uh, few programs, you can see it on the slide, are the programs that are spe specifically or specifically targeted uh, within this pandemic. I'm going to start first from the regular scheme that we did in the first, I would say, first quarter of the pandemic, what we did last March during normal conditions, these are the households that need intervention from the country. So I thought, uh, we thought, especially in this uh, tough condition, the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to make sure that these are these households, we save these households first before we do further programs or we come up with uh, uh, other programs uh, along the way. So what we did in the first half or first quarter of this pandemic is we expanded the number of the beneficiaries of the program from uh, on the family home program, we, we expanded the beneficiary from 9 million households to 10 million. And the, the, the way we disperse the money during normal condition, we disperse it every quarterly. So every three months, we disperse this money to, uh, to 9 million families. So I asked to the president during this pandemic, we, we would like to disperse this uh, money to these uh, beneficiaries every month from March all the way till December. Plus, we increased or we expanded the number of beneficiaries to 10 million. And that's, uh, you can see on the slide, the budget that uh, is committed to this program, the expansion of this family home program is around 2.878 billion US dollar or Indonesian rupiah, 37.4 trillion. Number two is the non-cash food assistance program, or uh, what the president has always been referred as program Kartu Sembako. What we did, again, uh, in, in March, is we expanded the beneficiaries. We increased the number of the beneficiaries from 15.2 million households to 20 million households, because uh, we believe that caused by this pandemic, there were more households that are suffering uh, due to this pandemic. Aside from expansion the beneficiaries, we increase the amount of the money disbursed to these families from 150,000 rupiah per month per family to 200,000 per month per family. And the budget is committed to this program is about 3.4 billion US dollar or Indonesian rupiah, 43.6 trillion. So these are the two uh, programs that we run during normal conditions, and then what we are doing in this pandemic is we expanded these two regular, con these two regular schemes. I'm going to move to this, the, the two programs under the special scheme. Number one is the food assistance program, which we did starting in April, and it's gonna end soon, uh, the, probably in the second week of July, is a package of a staple food, such as rice, canned food, cooking oil, and so on. And the beneficiaries of the food assistance program is 1.3 households within the Jakarta Metropolitan or the Jakarta a Greater Area, or we refer it uh, 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 Jabotabek. Jabodetabek. The amount of this uh, package is 600,000 uh, Indonesian rupiah per family per month or equivalent to 46.2 US dollar per family per month. And this will run for three months from April, May, June, or sometimes in mid-July, we're gonna end this program for the first quarter of this uh, pandemic. And the budget committed to that is US dollar 261 million or, or Indonesian rupiah 3.3 trillion. The other one, which is targeting the households outside Jabodetabek area or outside the Jakarta greater area, 
it is the direct cash transfer because we don't think it's a good idea to organize food assistance program throughout the country and it's, it's a logistical nightmare. So we thought the direct cash transfer would be much easier to do uh, within such a tight uh, time frame. And it is targeted for 9 million households living outside Jakarta greater area who are not beneficiaries of the regular social assistance program, family hope program, or the non-cash food assistance program. The money, uh, the money is dispersed via state-owned banks. There are four banks under state-owned banks or via post office. Majority of it is disbursed to post office because most of the families, the beneficiaries of the program, they don't have uh, bank accounts uh, with the uh, state-owned banks uh, we have. The number of the, or the, the value or the, the, the value of the cash that we disburse is, is equal or is similar to the value of the food assistance program that we do in Jabodetabek area, which is 600,000 rupiah per family per month. And the budget that we have committed to this direct cash transfer to the 9 million households is approximately US dollar, US dollar 1.23 billion US dollar or 16.2 trillion rupiah. So these are the programs, these are the lined up two on the regular schemes, we expanded the regular schemes, and then two on the special schemes that are not beneficiaries of the regular schemes. And this will end very soon, within two or three weeks. But then, what we have for the next plan is the continuation on, the, on these two uh, special scheme programs, which is the food assistance program and the direct cash transfer all the way till December. So the president had asked, had decided that we are going to continue these two, these two uh, special, special scheme programs. There are food assistance program for the Jakarta greater area and the direct or the unconditional cash transfer for the households uh, living outside Jakarta greater area. On the very bottom on the slide, I, I, I would give you some ideas on the budget that is committed to this, all these programs is on the regular scheme base program is about 81 trillion Indonesian rupiah equivalent to 6.28 billion US dollar under the special scheme is 39.2 trillion rupiah or equivalent to 2.98 or slightly less than 3 billion US dollar. So these are the programs uh, running under my ministry or under Minister of Social Affairs. Aside from these programs, there is also a program under uh, Kementerian Desa or uh, the uh, village ministry that is uh, doing a quite similar program to the one we are uh, doing, which is the, the direct cash transfer, and is also targeted to around 11 to 12 million households who are not the beneficiaries of all of these programs. So we want to make sure that we cover as many as uh, impacted households as possible, so then we uh, we make sure that this family or this household uh, don't need to suffer too long during this pandemic. And all of these programs that are run by the Ministry of Social Affairs is supported or is backed up by our uh, data. Uh, we refer it as uh, DTKS. That is, uh, is, is a data that we collect throughout these years is uh, consists of 97 million uh, persons or people or about 
29 million families. So we have this data, uh, and then we, we do updating on this data every uh, biannually or every six months. Uh, so because we need to make sure that all of these programs are running uh, uh, in accordance uh, with the plan on the ground, then uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the government is doing the right thing for the uh, households that is uh, uh, currently suffering from this pandemic. I think uh, that will be all from me. Uh, thank you again, and then uh, later maybe we will take some questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Batubara. Colleagues, uh, let us proceed now to the uh, Q&A session. We have received question from Seven Media, Moroccan Press Agency, Nikkei, Kyodo, Mainichi Simbun, Channel News Asia, Sydney Morning Herald, and Sky News. Minister Batubara, of course, will answer questions related to the government efforts in mitigating social impacts of COVID-19, while Professor Riku will provide updates on technical data and details. Let me start responding to a number of questions related to the foreign policies. First is on the latest development of international cooperation for COVID-19 mitigation. This is the question from Moroccan Press Agency. As of 10 June 2020, Indonesia has collaborated with 116 international partners, 116, comprising of 11 countries, 12 international organizations, and 93 NGOs. <clears throat> we have also facilitated international business-to-business -business support for 15 entities. In my briefing, I had mentioned some updates related to cooperation with the US and Chi US, China, and Japan. I'm sorry. <coughs> Second, Kyodo and CNA asked about the position of Indonesian government in regards to recent cases of Indonesian fishermen on Chinese vessels and what measures ha have been taken to avoid reoccurring cases. I have also mentioned the update of this issue in my briefing and in addition to my statement earlier, I would like to underline that the government of Indonesia has expressed its concern to the government of China regarding the repeated cases of Indonesian fishermen on board Chinese fishing vessel. From my conversation with a number of fishermen from different vessels, they told me exactly the same stories about the mistreatment on board. The legal process in Indonesia is moving forward. The Indonesian police has arrested three suspects responsible for sending Indonesian fishermen to Chinese fishing vessel. And they are currently under, under investigation according to law number 21, 20, 200, 2007. I repeat, law number 21, 2007 on trafficking in person. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has also communicated with the Chinese ambassador in Jakarta to express Indonesia's concern on the repeated cases. Meanwhile, communication remains frequent between Indonesian Embassy in Beijing and the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We look forward to see progress of fair and transparent investigation by the Chinese authorities. Now I would like to respond to Nikkei's question regarding the Vietnam proposal to hold the Physical ASEAN Leaders' Summit in the end of June. Colleagues, consultation among ASEAN member states continue to take place with regard to the 36 
ASEAN Leaders Summit proposed for the end of June. In fact, I have communicated with the Foreign Minister of Malaysia and Foreign Minister of Brunei this morning to also discuss this issue. Indonesia and ASEAN member states continue to work in close coordination with Vietnam as current ASEAN chair toward achieving an agreeable decision. Now the question by Nikkei and Sydney Morning Herald on the South China Sea, particularly on China proposed negotiation following Indonesia diplomatic note to the UN on the 26th of May. Colleagues, allow me to re-emphasize Indonesia consistent position on the South China Sea. Based on UNCLOS 1982, Indonesia does not have overlapping claims with China. Therefore, it is not relevant to hold any dialogue on maritime boundary delimitation. In the South China Sea, Indonesia has overlapping claim on maritime boundary delimitation only with Malaysia and Vietnam. In fact, through negotiation, Indonesia has successfully concluded its continental self boundaries with Vietnam and Malaysia. Indonesia is now negotiating the EEZ boundaries with both countries. My next response is for Kyoto on the question regarding the latest development on the possibility to integrate Jakarta Bandung train to Jakarta Surabaya train. Colleagues, last week I have answered this issue on where we are right now and there is no further update on this matter yet. And then in regard to the question of Moroccan Press News Agency on the latest report of COVID-19 relating to the foreign community in Indonesia, I would like to convey that per yesterday, 10 of June, 311 are positive, 26 foreign nationals have died, 204 have recovered, 485 are ODP or people under monitoring, and then 265 ODP foreign national have been repatriated. So colleague, that is all from me to respond to your question. Now I give the floor back to Minister Batubara uh, to respond to your question. And then after that, I would like to invite Professor Wiku. I thank you very much. Thank you again, Madam Minister Ratno. Um, I have one question with me here, asking, let me repeat the questions. On grassroots level, many reports of countdown, cash, cash transfer assistance where the rightful recipients were receiving less than the amount promised and announced by the government. How do you address this issue? Will there be sanction or legal enforcement? Um, all these programs responding to COVID-19 have a mechanism to avoid leakages, to support its accountability in the delivery. The mechanism starts with determining the target beneficiaries, delivery system, and the reporting system. Cash social assistance or the direct cash transfer of the Ministry of Social Affairs delivered in the form of cash transfer via state-owned banks. Uh, there are four state-owned banks and via PT Post or the Postal Office, which is a state-owned uh, company as well, state-owned enterprise. Based on their bank accounts by name and by address or at the post office through payment according to the registered name. So they have to carry their idea the ID, uh, the ID with the photos and so on. The payment then and is conducted by scanning the barcode on the, on the invitation and sending the, the photo because the, the, the officers there will take the photo 
of the person collecting the money and then send it to their servers. Except uh, the basic or the food assistance program, which is uh, distribute door to door to its beneficiary. So if there were any cut down by the neighborhood association or uh, similar to that of the community, it is actually beyond our control, beyond our mechanism. And it might need some actions by law if the person or the beneficiary thinks that uh, he or she will need to pursue that path. However, if we found cases in the field, such as eligible family who are not registered, thus we would like to bridge the communication among involved stakeholders to achieve mutual agreement among those who receive assistances and then to share the assistance or the food package with the family who are more eligible but not yet registered. So this is, I'm talking about this on the grassroots level uh, type of uh, uh, or, uh, resolving the, the problem. The next step will be the revision caused by that. The next step will be the revision of the data and to incorporate the family as the new target of the beneficiary and to replace those who we think are not eligible. That's all from me. Thank you. Her Excellency, Minister Retno Marsudi, and Minister Juliari Batubara, esteemed colleagues, foreign correspondents, and distinguished uh, journalists. Thank you for uh, your continuous attention to Indonesia effort to expedite the response uh, to this pandemic. I'm here to represent uh, Doni Monardo and thousands of officials at the task force, plus over 30,000 volunteers who will not stop fighting COVID-19 and emerge as champion in this round of battle. As the world uh, for largest country, a member of G20 and an active member of the UN, Indonesia together with our friends must show the world that this may be the first pandemic that we can conquer. Ladies and gentlemen, the coronavirus outbreak is first and foremost a public health crisis. And the most important response is coming from those in the front lines in hospitals, emergency services and care facilities. For the thousands of times, let me express our sincere gratitude to those dedicated individuals who put themselves at risk day after day in service to others and to our uh, nation. However, the forceful measures that we are, as a country, are taking a control of the spread of the virus have disrupted the economy. In the times where we were ambitious to take the development further and distribute our wealth even more equal across the archipelago, President Joko Widodo visited the task force headquarters at Graha BNPB yesterday and conveyed directives related to the adaptation of new habits so that people remain productive and safe from COVID-19 transmission. President reminded the importance of careful calculation in making policies that must be based on data and facts on the ground. Each regional and head who wanted to decide their area to enter the early phase of reactivation of sectors of activities to coordinate with the task force. This is the gigantic task that we have been doing in terms of big data integration with a form of a national integrated system, Bersatu Lawan COVID-19 or BLC. Because COVID-19 affects not just human health, but also socioeconomic elements. This will be the navigation in mitigating COVID-19. 
the pandemic we are facing today requires every individual of us to get involved, to stand up, and not to be taken aback by the outbreak. Though fears may permeate our minds, they should not curb us from being productive while still maintaining compliance towards the health protocol. Social capitalism has been rooted in our nation for so long, so-called gotong royong, or collective collaboration, and today is no exception. Social capitalism is the power of our nation. And now, let me get to the questions. First is uh, the question from Nikkei, Mainichi, and also Sky News, that recent spike of the positive case it, is it caused by PCR test acceleration, or is it still a delayed result from two or three weeks ago? Will you tighten the social restriction to lower the number? Is it an indication of a second wave in Indonesia? The tally that we are observing today is one I believe has resulted from Indonesia's escalating capacity to conduct testing. More laboratories and institutions are capable of carrying out testing. The local authorities, together with primary healthcare facilities, have been vigorously ramping up contact tracing. Active case findings, like in Jakarta, for example, which is an upside to this phenomenon. Therefore, we cannot just simply affiliate the increment with the second wave transmission of virus. If we take a look at the graph, please do carefully dissect the data according to regions. This will depict the conditions more accurately. I'm sure that we all can do that since our system has provided the tool to do that. I'm afraid that looking at numbers and graph collectively as one Indonesia would be biased, can cause misinterpretation and there is not much that we can conceive from it as in tackling the outbreak, truly dependent on local response and management to meet the necessities on the ground in accordance to the local wisdom. The second question is from Sky News. What update is there on COVID-19 vaccine trials? What stage are you at? As part of Indonesia's own actions to mitigate COVID-19 pandemic, the government with the help from Ekman Institute and University of Erlangga have been conducting several research regarding the locally transmitted COVID-19 virus characteristics in Indonesia and is developing COVID-19 vaccines at the moment. Another approach to create the vaccines is through bilateral joint cooperation with the Chinese government through the Sinovac uh, company. And then the third question comes from CNA. To avoid overcrowded public transports, are authorities working with companies to implement solutions such as extending work from home arrangement until a vaccine is found? The task force has developed a health uh, protocols in the implementations of reopening scenario towards a safe and productive society that is submitted to each ministry and related institutions, including regulating the number of workers in accordance with their regional risk categories, red, orange, yellow, or green, to control the virus uh, transmission. For example, in areas with moderate risk categories, orange, a maximum of 50% of workers can enter the office to avoid transmission of cases. The central government along with the regional governments are expected to conduct strict monitoring um, and evaluations on the implementations of the protocol so that the uh, control of cases and the economic sectors can be run in parallel and under control. The fourth question is from Morocco Press Agency. What new measures have been uh, taken to reach 20,000 tests per day as indicated by the Indonesian president? 
With the collective effort, Indonesia has surpassed the 10,000 tests per day mark, even reaching uh, 14,000 tests per day. With this progress, the President ordered a new target of 20,000 tests per day. Strong collaborations and hard work among 147 laboratories under the challenge of 11 ministries and government agencies is the key to reach the new target set. It is possible to escalate the number, for we started with only one laboratory back in March, then to 44, 49, 52, 78, 129, and now we reach 147 labs. The number will keep going up since we are still having around about 30 laboratories under preparations now to be able to do COVID-19 uh, testing. We also enhance the capacity of the human resources and supporting needs, especially to keep procuring reagent kits and consumables to all laboratories around the country. The fifth question is from Kyodo. When do you think is the best time for schools to reopen? I first would like to appreciate the Ministry of Education with the help of the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection, alongside Gugus Tugas and related organizations that has come uh, up with the several alternatives plan and adjustment to carry out studying programs in adaptation to the pandemic. I'm sure this is tough for us in regards to the questions, when is the time to reopen? The government has come up with an agreement that any sector about to reopen must first create protocols in accordance to COVID-19 related health policies. In every sector about to reopen, we need to lift in stages. For the educational sector, we need to first prepare the preconditioned states uh, today, comprising the preparations for the school, the teachers, the students, and the parents. For example, every school must ascertain that there are adequate ventilations, enough water access or sanitizers to the wash hands, and the setting of seating arrangement that must be at least 1.5 meters apart. All these technical considerations must be incorporated in the uh, protocol. When it comes to the timing, it would also heavily depend on the zone risk restriction and stratification in the area when the school is located. Our next goal is to be able to stratify priority of the timing based on the regions and school readiness with their protocols. In the meantime, remote studying is still the most preferable options we have today. The sixth uh, question is from CNA and Mainichi. Related to commercial flights, how can you ensure the safety of the passengers knowing there have been cases where they were tested positive upon arrival at the airports? When will you reopen the international flights? No due date has been set yet for reopening international flights. International flights will be open when we are ready. In terms of virus transmission and system preparedness, not only with respect to the domestic circumstances, but also the situation abroad. Just like any other transportation hub, every passengers arriving and departing will be required to go through several checkpoints. There will be temperature checking, rapid tests in the airports, and they need to show health and travel documents. Swap kits are also prepared. Every passenger will also be handed a health alert card in terms of surveillance. If a passenger is found to be positive, then he or she will be isolated or referred to the respective health care facilities as indicated. The process of uh, monitoring and evaluating health protocols enacted in transportation hubs has been carried out. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global health crisis without precedent in Indonesia since our Independence Day. It has triggered 
a health crisis and also the most severe economic recessions after 1997 crisis, causing enormous damage to people's welfare, jobs, and well-being. The strengthening of our social safety net and in the future social protection is one thing we should consider highly to be left as one of our legacies to our future generation. But laying out the ground to overcome this pandemic, not only because we can curb the spread of the SARS-CoV-2, but because this time we may leave something important. The pandemic of COVID-19 is a war we all are fighting for, a war that impacts all of our lives, a war that every individual counts, and hence need each, uh, each of us to fully participate in it. This phenomenon is not solely defined as a battle against invisible virus, but also an enormous battle against unproductivity, dire social straits, mass layouts, and lack of self-discipline. This is a battle we can foresee there will be no win to gain. Yet, through the hurdles, we need to keep our country in balance, protect it from any further setback. The economic disruptions caused by the virus created tremendous strains in almost all aspects of the economy. It has impaired the flow of income to many households. Without access to income, families are forced to cut back on necessities and in the end, risk themselves to a risk, not corona, but even more dangerous, poverty and hunger. Therefore, macro and microeconomic countermeasures, including social safety net and stable food package, direct cash aid, need to be rolled out to flatten the recessions and poverty curve. For this particular curve, we know how to do it. We have done it for the last 75 years. We have been working hard to elevate our people's state of welfare. Promoting ourselves from one of the poorest ex-colony of the European nations to be one of the leaders of ASEAN, Asia Africa, and the Muslim world, and champion, among others, of maritime sovereignty and sustainable development. And we will keep on doing what we have been doing, as promised, on our declarations of independence of 17 August 1945 and our constitutions. Through this pandemic, Indonesia will arise as one of the world leaders in COVID-19 mitigations. Thank you very much, and I would like to return to the Ibu Ratno. Thank you. Colleagues, so this is all for today. And thank you very much to you all, and thank you very much for Pak Menteri Batubara and Professor Wiku. And stay healthy, stay strong, stay united, and I'll see you next week. Thank you very much.